This is the Triage Method Podcast. I am Gary McGowan. This is Patty Farrell. And this week we're talking about nutrition. Yeah, so today we wanted to kind of, well, we're kind of coming to the end of the year and what a year it has been, Gary. You know? What a year. What an absolute beauty of the year. No, it actually has been one of the fucking weird years. Just like last year was a weird year. And this year was a weird year. However, on the podcast, we did cover quite a few topics. And so we thought we would do a little bit of, a, let's call it a masterclass, as we were kind of conceptualizing this as. Now, I actually don't think it's a masterclass. I actually think the stuff in this episode is pretty straightforward. However, what I wanted to do and like what we kind of wanted to do with this and the next episode as well is to create a kind of I don't know, reference podcasts. You know, someone's like, oh, I just want the basics. I just want the fundamentals. I just want the foundations, whatever terminology they use. They want that regarding nutrition. They just want to know what to do. So that's what we're going to cover today. We're just going to put it all plain and simple. Here's the basically like bullet points. Now, obviously, we're not going to cover absolutely everything you can go back and listen to the last whatever three four years however long the podcast has been going you can listen to those episodes and do a deep dive on all things nutrition training etc right and obviously this year we recovered a good few topics especially related to like you know fat loss uh, and different things like that which i know that is why a lot of people get into managing their nutrition right but I wanted to have a reference episode, whether you are a coach yourself and you just want to be able to send something to your clients or you are an individual who, you know, you care about your health, your nutrition, whatever. And maybe you want to you know, help your grandmother, your fucking mother. I don't know. Uh, you wanted to help them. You want to be like, right, here's an episode. Listen to this. Now you have the information, right? Or perhaps, you know, you just want to reference it back yourself. You're like, oh, well, how much should I be eating of this? Or how should I be doing this X, Y, Z with the diet? So we're basically doing a little bit of a masterclass with nutrition today before we get you know stuck into this gary do you have anything to say do you to catch up people on anything in your life anything going on anything at all i'm going to tenerife on friday to sun myself so i have a glorious tan in order to celebrate the birth of christ the following week so are you doing that for soul invictus seen as he was actually born on the 25th of december and uh, i believe jesus stole his birthday even though jesus was clearly born in the springtime Please, no blasphemy on this podcast. Paul Invictus, the absolute Chad of all the gods. All the gods? Yeah. Dear Lord. <laughs> no, we're good to go on and talk about uh, theological mysteries of nutrition. Um, no, we will not be talking about that. That's actually a next year's episode. But anyway, let's get stuck into the nutrition. So first of all, we have to consider what are we actually looking for with nutrition? Because obviously nutrition contributes to a variety of things within the body. And I don't, that's actually probably a poor way of saying it. It contributes to a variety of things that we would care about that are related to the body is probably more accurate in saying it. And what I mean by that is your nutrition does influence a few things. First of all, it influences your body composition, right? This is one of those things that people, you know, they care about. They care about how they look, right? And the thing about nutrition and influencing your body composition, it is a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. And you have to get that understanding. And you see these kind of, I don't know, memes and stuff online where it's like, oh, it's 70% diet and 30% training or 50% diet or 100% training and fucking all these numbers. They don't even make sense, right? But all you have to understand is that nutrition plays a role. It is a piece of the puzzle with all of this stuff. And as a result, if you want to have improved body composition, you're going to have to master your nutrition in some manner, shape or form, right? So that's the first thing. It contributes to body composition, right? And again, as I said, I know a lot of people are listening to podcasts like this because they care about their body composition, or at least that's how most people's health journeys start, right? But nutrition does more than that. It also contributes to our overall health or the overall health of the organism. In this case, it's us, right? It contributes to our health or it can potentially detract from our health, okay? So there's the first two things, but it also contributes to, we'll call it our experience of life, right? And we're going to put this down under the category of performance, right? But it is actually a little bit more than just, you know, Oh, how fast did I do a thing or how well did I do a thing or whatever? It also contributes to, you know, your mental well-being, your mood, all that kind of stuff. So we've basically got three things that the nutrition is playing a role in health, body composition and performance. Right. So we want to get our nutrition sorted because we care about those things in some way, manner, shape or form. Now, all of them, you know, nutrition is important for some of them. 
you know, especially something like body composition, for example, like if you don't have a mastery over your nutrition, you're kind of pissing in the wind. You're not going to get the body composition that you want, whether that's to gain muscle, muscle, whether that's to gain muscle, lose fat, maintain your body weight, whatever it is, you're just not going to move towards your objective unless you get your nutrition sorted, right? However, there's also things where maybe you care about your health. If you don't get your nutrition sorted, you know, and that could be a variety of things. You don't have the right, you know, calorie balance. You've uh, the, the wrong constituents of, you know, fat intake, whatever. You can actually be detracting from your health or you could potentially not be reaching your health maximum. And I know a lot of people think of health as purely the, the absence of disease, for example. That's not really the case because you can be doing stuff now that helps you live longer into the future and then also have a you know, higher quality of life through that health span, right? So we care about nutrition. That should be obvious enough. This is the episode to tell you how to eat, basically. Now, myself and Gary, neither of us are registered dietitians. So if you take this as medical advice, you're simply in the wrong. We are not <laughs> medical practitioners. Gary is actually one part medical practitioner because he's a physiotherapist, but me, I'm actually an idiot, right? Anyway, Gary, do you have anything to say on that so far? No, I would be very much in agreement that nutrition can kind of serve three primary things that we generally think about with our clients. And those are health, performance, and body composition. And when you zoom in on health, you can view it in terms of, you know, short-term deficiencies. You know, if things are missing from your diet, what could potentially happen? Um, for example, very short-term, you're going to be low on energy, you're going to be hungry, etc. cetera. With the slightly longer term, you might start to develop deficiencies, your insufficiencies. And then there's also the contributors to the diet that, that can accumulate over time to potentially lead to risk. So like you were suggesting, if you're you know, consuming certain types of fat in very high quantities, like saturated fat, that might contribute to cardiovascular disease risk over time. That's something you're not going to feel. You're not going to see it in five years, 10 years, but you might see it in 40 years. And that's why nutrition needs to be kind of thought of both in terms of what the purpose of changing nutrition is you know is it for health is it for performance is it for body composition and then within health is it for cardiovascular disease neurological disease etc but then also temporarily in terms of asking yourself is the goal of changing my nutrition to optimize one of these variables for the next five years the next six months maybe if you're a fighter or something or a power lifter could be the next six weeks or is it to maximize those outcomes over multiple decades and there are the different dimensions you need to be thinking about when you enter that that enter and um, making that decision making process of what am i going to do to change my nutrition 100 percent, right so the place that we start it comes down to energy balance right and what i mean by this is the calories you consume and the calories you expend in a day they are related right or they have a relationship with your body composition and your body weight right and the reason we bring this up as a starting point because this actually dictates so much, both with regards to the actual like body composition stuff that we're you know looking for or or, or, or chasing, and um, and that's this that's the place where most people start. They're like, oh, calories in, calories out. We have this equation that's going to dictate how much I weigh, how much body fat I have, and that's true. But it does also do a lot of stuff in regards to performance. Like Gary said, like you you know you're not going to be at your best performance. Like no one is at their best mood performance whatever if you're kind of cranky from not having eaten right if you're kind of like underfed you know you're not going to be at your best right so it clearly impacts on that and obviously it impacts on your health because if we are you know moving towards higher bmis higher obesity levels you know higher body fat levels that is potentially detracting from our health but more than that you know we do also have a relationship there with stuff like a uh, fatty liver right or non-alcoholic fatty liver and other things and they're also dictated by the calories that we're consuming relative to the calories that we are expending, right? So we have to get this right. But what does that actually mean? So Gary, what like calories in, calories out? What are we talking about here? Yeah, so fundamentally what we're talking about here is the difference between what you're taking in and what is going out. And the difficult thing about that, as we've discussed many times in the podcast, is that there's only so much we can measure. And much of this is for the vast majority of the population, under subconscious control in that when you're deciding, you know, where you end up on that equation on any given day, most people are going to end up with some sort of surplus or deficit as a result of um, hunger cues or appetite signals, as a result of 
food that was available to them as a result of the social situation in which they found themselves that day, where they were working, what uh, shops were on site, uh, whether or not they had prepared food, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's many different variables that go into determining, you know, what's actually occurring that determines the, the calories in. And then also, how does that relate to calories out? You know, are you working an active job? Are you consciously exercising, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that for most people, there are many different variables that go into determining where you come out of that equation. And when people get into fitness, what they try to do is start to get some control over those things. So on the calories inside of things, what they'll start to do is to maybe track their calories or macronutrients or what they might do first and foremost is try to choose lower calorie options if they're trying to lose weight or higher calorie options if they're trying to gain weight. They might try to have a specific meal structure that they follow so that they're controlling that calories in. And then what they might start to do is, you know, control their calories out in some way by trying to take more steps each day by adopting a formal exercise routine, etc. So these types of things are attempts at getting control over the difference between your calories in and your calories out. The astute practitioner or trainee will realize that there's many different things that you cannot control, such as, you know, how much heat your body is producing or energy that it's wasting, how much you're fidgeting throughout the day. You can consciously make yourself tap your foot, but a lot of the time that's happening subconsciously. How often you're blinking, how much you're sweating, et cetera, et cetera. Many different variables under the hood are not directly measurable for the user at home who's trying to improve their health and fitness. That also occurs on the calories inside of the spectrum where you can't exactly tell um, what the margin of error on the food label that you're reading is, um, how efficient your digestive tract is going to be at extracting all nutrients um, versus someone else, and then how the complexities of the overall diet might affect that. For example, if you're eating a food that gives you diarrhea versus a food that gets stuck in your gut for longer, that might impact the amount of nutrients that have been extracted during that gut transit time. So there's many different things there that we can't necessarily measure. So we try to control what we can control. And then that's when we end up having some sort of idea of where our calorie balance or imbalance is at. And for health, for the vast majority of the people, by definition, given that overweight and obesity is a larger problem than underweight, would be trying to maintain a calorie deficit. In Ireland, I think 35% or so are um, in the obese category, and then roughly 65 to 67% are overweight. So you've got two thirds of the population that would likely benefit from losing some degree of body fat. Um, obviously, there's you don't necessarily, as we've discussed many times before, just rely on BMI when making these decisions. But you can probably appreciate that most people are going to be trying to reduce their calories rather than increase them. Of course, we do encounter many people at triage who are trying to increase their calories, particularly those who are trying to gain muscle or potentially those who are you know, coming out of eating disorder recovery or something like that. But most people are going to be trying to make some changes in the direction of reducing their calorie intake, increasing their calorie output or energy expenditure or daily activity levels with the intent of ending up at a deficit at the end of the day, week, month, or designated diet period. Mm. <clears throat> and this is one of those things that if you get this if you understand calories you understand this calorie balance this equation of you know your calories in the stuff that you're eating versus the calories that you're expending if you understand this it actually explains so much right and this is where a lot of people fall down especially if you're kind of new to this stuff you'll get you know caught up and sold in these lies of like oh food timing is the thing that matters oh uh, certain foods are the things that matter right ultimately all diet strategies right? If you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, maintain weight, improve health, improve performance, whatever it is, they all come back fundamentally to calories, right? They are in some way, say you're going on a fat loss diet, you know, your friend down the road, they're like, oh, I'm on this diet. It's helping me lose weight, right? The diet that they are doing is just putting them in, or rather the way that they are eating is just putting them in a calorie deficit. You know, it's leading them to consume less calories than they previously consumed. And as a result, they're losing weight, right? But when we're looking at this stuff, we don't want to just think about the transient, like, oh, well, I'll go on this diet or I'll cut out this food group or whatever. We want to be thinking like, how are we going to set up our diet long-term so that we can find a way to eat at a level of calories that is right for our body, right? Because what happens is, it, you know, weight gain creeps up on you, 
You know, you basically fall, find yourself at maintenance, right? You find yourself, you find this equilibrium between you know, the calories that you're consuming and, you know, the expenditure that you have. Most people find themselves at some sort of equilibrium around that maintenance, right? That might not lead you to the best body composition that, you know, you desire or the best performance or whatever, but most people find themselves at maintenance or what often happens in the Western world, at least, is you find yourself at an ever so slight surplus, right? And that's either through, uh, you know, consuming more calories or, it's either through or either through consuming more calories or through uh, you know moving less over time. This often happens. You'll see, especially you know people that transition away from being in university and college or whatever, they go into the working world and they go from you know having to you know cycle to college and you know commute in between different you know uh, classroom settings, whatever, and they're up at you know fifteen thousand steps per day, and they go from that environment. They get a car when they're you know twenty or something. And then they go into the working world and then all of a sudden they're sitting at a desk for eight hours per day, right? And they probably end up eating, you know, relatively similar to what they were eating before because they had built up those habits. And now all of a sudden we're in a situation where your calories out, the expenditure side of things is now much lower than where it used to be. And as a result, even though you're doing the same stuff in terms of what you think you're doing, the conscious stuff where you're like, I'm still eating the exact same, how come I'm gaining weight? The reason, the rationale behind that is because now you are in a calorie surplus because we've got this mis mismatch between calories in and calories out, right? Now, ultimately, again, we could spend all day talking about this, but I think that gets the, the, the point across. There is this equation. There is this kind of ratio, this relationship between these two numbers. And depending on which way we manipulate one or the other, whether you, you know, eat more or eat less or you move more or move less, that then influences where we are at with our overall calorie expenditure and our overall calorie you know intake and as a result you know how our body composition moves how our health changes how our performance changes etc right so ultimately how do we find like where we should be at with these calories so we understand that you know if we want to lose weight we need to be in some sort of deficit if we want to just maintain we need to just eat at roughly calorie maintenance and if we want to gain we need to consume a slight surplus of calories whether again that's true eating more uh, or moving less or a combination of the two right so how do we find this number this is the thing that people kind of get really caught up on and ultimately you know it depends on where you're at Right. You could. And this is what most people do. They go, oh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start tracking calories. Right. And they'll enter in, you know, whatever their their body composition metrics or, you know, anthropometry. Uh, and they'll enter it into some calculator they find online or maybe they download my fitness pal and they just enter in the data into the equation that my fitness pal you know, gives you, right? And ultimately, that is one way to work out where your calories are at, where like you should be at with the diet based on your goals. Now, most people, it's a shock when they first do it, right? And that's either from the perspective of, you know, all of a sudden they look at a number and they're like, Jesus, I didn't know that I should be consuming 2000 calories. Or they look at that number and they set like the, the weight loss targets that they have um, way too aggressive. Like they're like, I want to be losing like five kilos per week, right? Because they don't have that kind of, you know, what, what would you call it? An accurate uh, idea of how fast this should, stuff should go, right? So a lot of people get shocked by that. I actually don't think that is the best method, right? Using some sort of calculator. It is definitely one method and it's definitely helpful. However, what we generally advocate and we do it with a lot of our clients as we are onboarding them is we get them to track what they're already doing right? Like, what does your diet look like now? Let's just get you to track for a few days so that you can see, oh, this is what I'm consuming. This is how much I'm consuming. This is where it comes out at, at, with the calories. The issue with this is most people do struggle with um, accurately portraying what they actually eat and not changing that, right? Because, you know, if you start tracking things, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, eat the Oreos that I have over there because I don't want to have to count that. So all of a sudden you stop eating the, the snacks, you, you automatically or subconsciously cut down on the extra calories you're consuming right so that is one issue with that but we can still account for that you know we can start being like oh how is this the diet that you've recorded how is that in relation to what you were previously doing oh you were previously doing you were eating a little bit more here blah 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 and we can kind of get an idea right then we also want to track body weight we want to see where that is trending how that is moving how that is being influenced by the diet that we're consuming like if you're saying this is the way i've always been eating 
and we track your body weight. And at the start of the week, you're 87 kilos. And then at the end of the week, you're 83 kilos. You know, we know that there's some mis mismatch here. Something happened here where you're actually probably now in a deficit, even though you're saying, this is how I've normally eating. Now that can happen a, a variety of ways. Some people can be like, oh yeah, my Monday to Friday, this is perfect. And then all of a sudden on Saturday and Sunday, they are in this super mega huge surplus or in 20,000 calories on Saturday, Saturday 15,000 calories on Sunday, you know? Um, so we have to look at a broader time scale. But if you track calories, track body weight for two weeks, you should have a fairly good idea in terms of where your calories should be at, right? If you're trying to lose weight, you know, we want to be at a deficit. So if you find you are losing weight at the calorie level that you're at, you are in a deficit. If you find you're maintaining your weight, great, you found maintenance. If you found that you're slowly gaining weight, cool, you found what, you know, a surplus is for you, right? So that's the first thing we want to do. That's, I always call it the average and adjust method, right? Because what we have there is we find out the average, we find out what happened, you know, what we were eating, we found out what that did with our body. Um, and then we adjust from there. The other variable that you can track is as well as that is our overall like energy expenditure. Now, this is a little bit harder to track, um, but there are ways to do it. Like say, for example, if you have something like an Apple watch or a fitness tracking watch, they will give you some sort of number in terms of the calories that you burned throughout that day. It actually doesn't matter how accurate that actually is. We just want to get an idea of where that number is at, right? You can also do something like tracking the number of steps that you've taken per day. And that is kind of a proxy method or a proxy measure, I should say, for we'll call it this non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is all the kind of non-exercise stuff that you do throughout the day. Like we were saying, like fidgeting, different things like that, right? It gives us a little bit of a proxy for that number, right? So we have a number of variables that we can track. We can track the calories that we're consuming in terms of the food that we're eating. We can track how that affects our body weight. And then we can also tra track you know, the calorie expenditure throughout the day, either through, you know, again, a fitness tracking watch or something, or the number of steps that we're doing per day. All of that information taken together should give you a relatively good idea of where your calories should be at for your given goal. So Gary, before we move on from that, do you have anything to say on that, you know, calorie side of things? No, I think that covers most of what's required there, really. Obviously, there's some more nuances in terms of how you change things over time metabolic adaptation etc but i think that covers the basics yeah and see this is the thing again like we're not going to be able to cover absolutely everything we've done more in-depth podcasts you know and series on this stuff, series series on this stuff so again you can always go back and listen to this the, the other podcast series on this stuff but for now you have a pretty good idea of where calories should be at and how to find that rough number right you also have an idea of how to adjust that if we want to lose weight or you know, start trending the body weight downwards, we want to eat at a calorie deficit. Now, again, we can go into the magnitude of that deficit. Generally, we recommend a slower, steadier rate and really focus on food habits, but maybe you want to be more aggressive with things and you know, that's okay, right? And for most people, I would probably stay away from anything more than like a 500 calorie deficit per day. While yeah, shorter periods of time, it can be fine to do that, for most people, it's probably not going to be the most effective way to set up their diet because what always happens, and it's kind of what I always alluded to, people will eat a thousand calorie deficit Monday to Friday and be really restricted. And all of a sudden come Saturday, they're like, you know what, fuck this shit. And then it's, you know, floodgates are open. I'll start again on Monday. And that's unfortunately the way it happens. So you start with a lower, you know, calorie deficit, you know, 250 calories less than what you think your maintenance is at. And all of a sudden it's actually much easier to stick to that long term because we have to remember this stuff is consistent. You know, this stuff is over time. We have to look at it at a longer time horizon than just what did I do this day? Because that is, again, something that people will often do. They'll be like, oh, my diet is so good. And you look at their diet and you're like, Jesus, your diet is really good. But you realize that they're doing this Monday to Thursday and then Friday, Saturday and Sunday are you know, way off track with this stuff, right? So we have to look at it over a longer period of time, right? So calories, you understand them. The next thing then is how much protein should we be consuming? And the reason we're looking at protein first is because... Um, I believe protein it derives from the Greek word protos, which means first, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And that is simply why we're doing it. No, the actual reason uh, we are looking at protein first 
is because that ha like protein, first of all, is one of the macronutrients of the diet. So it's a nutrient that we have to eat in macro quantities. And it is one of those nutrients that a lot of people are just not consuming enough of, especially considering most people that are listening to this podcast or, you know, people that are being sent this podcast, they're probably looking for some improvement in body composition, some improvement in their overall health and some improvement in their overall performance. And as a result, generally speaking, we want to be consuming more than just the you know, bare minimum requirements for protein, right? However, that doesn't mean that we have to consume this super high, you know, quantity protein diet, right? We want to find the, the number that is right for us, right? And in the literature, you're going to find a huge, huge range of where protein should be at from the, this is just, you know, covers cases of deficiency, anything less than this, you're technically protein deficient. And then anything more than this, all the way up to the top, we have that like, okay, well, you know, the research has shown that this number is not associated with any negative health outcomes. We don't know if, you know, more is better or worse. And then there's obviously the kind of number in between those where it's like, yeah, this seems to work for most people, for most goals, and this is probably where we should be at, right? And those kind of bottom end and top end recommendations are well, probably somewhere in the range, again, depending on what research you look at and what numbers you look at, it's probably somewhere in the range of 0 0.8 to 3.3 .3 grams per kilo. That seems to be the range, right? Now, if you're just to take away, you know, fucking 20,000 view or 20,000 feet view of this stuff and look at it and go, okay, well, where should I be at? As long as you're in that range, I would be fairly happy in terms of we're just talking about broad population. However, if we're looking to optimize this stuff and actually you know, really get the most out of this, I'm probably going to say that most people are probably going to do best in the kind of 1.5 to 2.5 range. And for me, I just generally set people with, cal with, the, with protein intake, usually I small or I... I bring that range down a little bit and i'm going to say 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kilo anywhere in there you're pretty good to go for whatever goal that you have and if you want to really simplify it two grams per kilo happy days you're sorted now that's not always the case if you are an individual that is you know uh, very obese you know you're whatever 200 kilos you maybe you don't need to consume that much uh, protein um, but it is something to be aware of that, you know, your body fatness does influence this. And the reason for that is that body fat itself is not as metabolically active as a tissue as the other tissues in your body, such as muscle, organs, etc. And as a result, it doesn't actually have as high a requirement for protein, right? However, there are potentially still benefits for consuming a high protein diet in the obese. And we did an obesity series. So if you want to go back and listen to that, you can. What do you think of those numbers, Gary? Where would you generally think uh, you would put people at for protein? Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. I think that I, I find myself dealing with kind of two stereotypical clients. The first is the person who has come in for, to our coaching service outside of the fitness industry. They're not a personal trainer. They don't have a background in bodybuilding, etc. And typically that person, they have an idea of what foods are generally in the healthy category, but they're not making great choices with respect to their protein intake. So they might be doing a great job of controlling the calories, getting fiber, getting a nutrient dense diet, but their protein intake isn't great. And for that type of individual, I direct my coaching towards trying to get them to improve their protein intake. The other client is the personal trainer or the person who comes from a bodybuilding background who's having, who feels like if they don't have 50 to 60 grams of protein four to six times per day, they're wasting their time. And they're having three grams plus per kilo of body weight every single day. Um, and for them, it would be a better use of their calories to have more carbohydrates to fuel their training. So for me, anyway, I find myself recommending around that two grams per kilo as probably my average recommendation, a little bit higher for my clients who are dieting or find it more satiating or the client who was previously at three grams, who I want to bring down a little bit. Uh, but most people, I think around that two gram level, I do go a little bit lower sometimes, um, especially if I've set the target of two grams for someone and it's just too much for them. Um, but I find that if someone is at a reasonable level of calories, if they're at maintenance or in a surplus, especially as you get towards larger uh, calorie intakes, getting, you know, a little bit below two grams, uh, 
might be fine but i think two grams is generally quite practical for people especially when considering protein timing because one of the things that happens with a lot of my clients who are trying to gain weight is that if i give them let's say they're 70 kilos if i give them the target of two grams per kilo and they're eating four meals per day and they're trying to ensure they have plenty of protein before and after a workout then they might be getting so much protein from like indirect sources like their oats, their vegetables, etc., that for them to have direct protein sources, it actually pushes them a bit above beyond the two gram per kilo recommendation. So that's fine in those cases as well. But around there, two grams, I think, is my average recommendation. Yeah, like once you're in that kind of one to three grams, yeah, you're good to go. Like you're 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 good to go there. However, if we're really looking to optimize things. I would say most people in and around that two grams. And again, like I have that kind of bracket of 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kilo. But again, simplify it here, two grams per kilo in and around there, happy days, you're good to go. There's, a, there's arguments to be made for a lower, there's arguments to be made for a higher. Again, it's dependent on the situation. We're just giving these broad recommendations here, right? Now, carbs, I'm actually going to come back to carbs because we actually want to set other parts of the diet first, right? And that'll make sense in a second, right? But the next thing we're gonna move on to is our fat intake. And there's a number of things that we have to concern ourselves here about our overall fat intake. And the first thing is how much, like what, what's the total amount of fat that we wanna consume in the diet? Because you know, I know people are gonna to come to this from a low fat background, people are gonna to come to this from a high fat background, and they're gonna have like all these different ideas about where fat intake should be at, right? Now, unfortunately, the research is actually not that clear in terms of where, fat intake should actually be at in terms of the overall total percentage of the diet or the overall grams per kilogram, right? We generally like grams per kilogram rather than percentages because it's a little bit more accurate because it actually ties it back to generally the thing that we're trying to influence. And it's also more individualized where like we have some clients that are up at like 5,000 calories per day, and we might not want them to consume, you know, 30% of their diet from fats, right? So grams per kilo is generally a better metric in our eyes, at least, right? But coming back to fats, it's kind of a little bit convoluted in the research, and we're left a lot of the time using anecdote and kind of proxy measures, which we'll talk about in a second, right? Would generally become out of the figure of 0.6 to one gram per kilo. That's generally where we want fat intake to be. Now, there's definitely an argument for times with lower, and there's definitely an argument for times for higher. However, most people are probably going to do quite well in somewhere in that range of 0.6 to one gram per kilo, right? What are your thoughts on that there initially, Gary? Yeah, I would agree. I think that going much below that limits both food choices and potential potentially fat soluble nutrients and other nutrients that come in fatty foods um so i think that's one of the risks of going too low and then going just too high it can it can upset your digestive system a little bit sometimes if you're having like up to two grams per kilo of fat per day you know it slows down gut transit time if you're trying to get in a lot of calories sometimes you can feel a bit not so good i've been in that place myself and the higher you go with fat as well you do run into the situation where you're potentially driving your saturated fat intake up too high and you can run into some problems there too so for most people i think somewhere between 0.6 and one gram i will go up to maybe one to 1.5 grams for some of my clients who really need to push calories up but very rarely am i going much beyond 1.5 uh, grams per day unless it's uh, 1.5 grams per kilo unless it's a situation where someone just has a strong preference for a low carbohydrate high fat diet um which is totally appropriate in some instances. Yeah, hundred percent. And the next thing that we need to consider with this is that what, like, what is the actual bare minimum, right? Because I know some people are going to be like, well, I don't want to consume fat because, you know, I've talked to my doctor and, you know, they said a little bit of heart disease here going on, or I have elevated LDL or triglycerides are a bit higher or whatever, or maybe that's something they, they're concerned about in their overall family. And they're a little bit scared of fat, right? So what's the bare minimum? Well, the bare minimum is actually lower than you think, right? Because even though we're talking about, oh, well, like how much would we consume in a general diet? Like we don't actually need to consume that much. However, we do need to consume the essential fatty acids, right? Now there's a little bit, which we won't get into here, a little bit of um, discussion about what are the actual essential fatty acids, whether it's these, you know, particular, we'll call them parent molecules or the breakdown products of those molecules in the body. 
we don't need to concern ourselves with that discussion. However, we do need to understand that there are some essential fatty acids within the diet. The, there are an omega-6 branch and an omega-3 branch of these, right? Now, the omega-6 branch, we don't really need to concern ourselves with you know, knowing the exact minimum figure of this, because unless you're doing com something completely you know, weird with the diet, there's you know, very little um, potential for you to not be getting enough omega-6 in your diet, right? So we can kind of ignore that, even though they are still essential, and um, we can kind of ignore it, especially in the modern diet. Now there's, again, unless you're doing something really squirrely with the diet, we don't need to consider it, right? However, with the omega-3 branch, most people are not, unless they actually actively look at this stuff, they're not actively getting enough omega-3s in their diet. However, we can prioritize these and we can get a sufficient amount to both cover the essential fatty acid needs and then also cover you know, the potential or gain, I should say, the potential health promoting and benefits of these nutrients as well, right? So when we're talking about the essential fatty acids, if we're like, what's the bare minimum fat we need to consume? Well, we probably need to consume maybe 10 grams of fat, right? And I'm going to say that's from a mixed source that gets you some omega-6s, uh, you know, the general, you know, fat sources that we're eating, you're going to get enough omega-6s from those. And then also, you know, we probably want to get like three to five grams of EPA slash DHA per day. We can just break that down into the omega-3s. Now that would be on the top end, not the top end. I shouldn't say it's not like, you know, more is going to be necessarily harmful, but if we're like, what's the absolute bare minimum? Well, it's probably one gram per day of EPA slash DHA, right? So we can just put that in omega-3s. Most people are going to be most familiar with this stuff in terms of like a fish oil capsule. You know, most fish oil capsules have like 300 milligrams of EPA slash DHA. And um, so you're talking about like three fish oil capsules, right? Unless you're getting a higher quality one or a higher quantity, higher dose one, right? So that's the bare minimum here that we need to be consuming roughly that kind of one gram of omega-3s and then roughly you know a couple of grams of omega-6s again depending on exactly what population we're talking about right but again as i said most people don't need to consider the omega-6 things but most people do need to consider the omega-3s if we're looking at you know getting the best best from our uh, our nutrition for our health for our body composition for our performance i'm going to say try to consume three grams uh, of omega-3s per day. Now you can do this through a number of things. You can either supplement yourself. You can you know, buy a fish oil supplement or a krill oil supplement, or you can potentially just eat fatty fish, cold water fatty fish, ideally a couple of times per week. The good thing about fats in general is that we don't necessarily need to consider them always on a single day perspective because they can be more easily stored in the body we can consider it on a weekly and even a monthly basis right so if you were to say right how do i get enough fats in my diet or omega-3 fats in my diet you know eat some cold water fatty fish two to four times per week depending on the the size of it or if you're not willing to do that or you don't have access to that kind of stuff you're going to have to consume some sort of omega-3 supplement whether it's krill oil if you're uh you know, a plant-based uh, individual, or it's omega-3s from fish oil, that's something that you're going to consider, right? Do you have anything to say there, Gary, on the essential fatty acids um, at all? No, I think that's pretty clear. Fantastic. And then the final thing that we want to consider about our overall fat intake is our saturated fat intake, right? So we've got a number, we've got 0 0.6 to 1 gram per kilo. That's our starting point. We're like, okay, that's how much fat I'm consuming in the day, right? And in that, I'm trying to consume some omega-3s. I know I don't really have to think about our omega-6 intake because you know, you're going to get it in the diet regardless. Um, but the final thing, the final piece of the puzzle is our saturated fat intake, right? How much saturated fat should we be taking in? This is you know, something that people will be on such dichotomous ends. People are like, hey, you should consume absolutely zero saturated fat. Other individuals be like, yeah, the vast majority of my fat intake is saturated fat. If we're looking at this from a health and longevity perspective, especially considering that heart disease is arguably the biggest killer of humans in the world. I mean, like humans have to die some way, but this is the, the thing that gets most of us. Um, as we've talked about in a previous episode and previous episodes, and um, this is the, the one of the biggest killers uh, for humans, especially as we get into our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or older age at least. Um, how much fat or how much saturated fat should we be consuming, Gary? What's the number? I think uh, if you're getting below 
10% of your total daily calories from saturated fat, you're doing excellent. At the minimum, I would say less than 15%. Okay, so if you're making changes at the start, see if you can get it below 15%. And then if you can get it below 10%, fantastic, even better. Um, potentially option to go even lower if you're already got established cardiovascular disease and you're trying to do as much as you possibly can. But most people, if you can get less than 10%, you're doing fantastic. Less than 15% is pretty good. And you can begin to, you know, modify how strictly you control that as well, depending on your blood lipids, for example. You know, if you're consistently consuming 15% of your calories per day from saturated fat, and your LDL is like 1.5, it's in a great place, um, and all your other blood lipids are in a good place as per your doctor, then you can be pretty happy, you know? Um, if you're consuming already 5% saturated, 5% calories from saturated fat and your lipids are all over the place and you've got high cardiovascular disease risk, then there might be things beyond the diet that you need to start controlling. So it just depends where you're at with that and your overall cardiovascular risk. But I think less than 10%, ideally, uh, less than five, 15% would be a good start for a lot of people. Yeah. And this is important to understand that we're relating this back to calories here. So it's 10 to 15% of total calories. And this again, does lead to a situation where, you know, especially for people that are exercising regularly and they have, you know, relatively higher uh, caloric needs, you can be in a position where you're actually still consuming quite a lot of saturated fat, right? And that might be okay for you. That might still be a negative for you just because of the total magnitude of the calories that are being consumed. However, we do have a situation where if you are uh, engaging in exercise, that is kind of a heart protective uh, activity. So you potentially are having less of a, an issue. Like basically you're protecting yourself against the higher saturated fat intake that the calorie expenditure is allowing you, if that makes sense, right? But either way, there still is this kind of 10 to 15% of total calories. That seems to be where the research suggests is, you know, we want to keep saturated fat below that. Now, I'm not an advocate of being really scared of the diet. You know, people do this where they're like, oh, geez, I can never have butter ever again. Or, you know, I used to like having, you know, a fry up on the weekend and oh, I'm fucked now. Like I can't do that because saturated fat intake, it's too high. I'm not an advocate of that being like that extreme with things, unless obviously your doctor or your dietitian has advised that because you're, your blood lipids are in a really bad place. For most people, that's just going to be a non-issue. Once you are consuming a relatively healthful diet overall, you're keeping your, your body weight in check, you're keeping your overall calories in check, and then you're also keeping saturated fat in a relatively good place. Like I've seen individuals that have had like 20% of their diet from saturated fat and they literally are sub two LDL, you know? So again, it's going to be back or brought back to your individual risk. However, unless you have blood lipids to work on, unless you have like actual data to work on, it's pretty safe to assume that getting below 10% of your overall calories from saturated fat is probably a good place to be at. And, and this is, you know, supported by a lot of converging lines of evidence and also the actual evolution of humans you know i know a lot of people go like oh well humans evolved to eat a lot of fat and whatever none of that was saturated fat i don't know where you're getting saturated fat you go out and hunt in the fucking kalahari desert you're not getting any saturated fat there mate you know um but anyway that's a little bit of a, a tangent there do you have anything else to say on fat intake gary before we move back to carbohydrates no we can move back to the carbs now we would basically be the advocates of a higher carbohydrate diet. Well, I suppose, depending on how you view it, we are of the perspective that whatever you've, uh, calories you've allotted towards protein. So you've set your protein at, let's say two grams, right? And then you've set your fats at 0 0.6 grams, right? You've done that. You're, I know where my protein is at. I know where my fat is at. We basically say, you know, the rest of your calories can go towards carbs. Now we might modify that a little bit depending on the individual. You know, there might be a case where someone is like doing a very particular event where it's like, you know, it actually makes more sense to have higher fats. And as a result of that, lower carbs, but for the general population, higher carbohydrate diets, you know, whatever is left of our calories, that's where we're going to put them. That actually might be a lot. And that might be very little depending on your overall activity level. Right. And um, 
Do you have any thoughts further to that? Because I'm going to move on to Fiverr relatively quickly because I actually don't think there's a huge amount to discuss with this. I know people are scared of carbs sometimes. I know people are like, oh, I shouldn't be eating carbs. But ultimately, it's a little bit of a nothing burger for me where I'm like, just stop being scared of them. They're actually probably one of the most beneficial nutrients we can have in the diet, especially since we've all evolved post um, the agricultural revolution. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very much pro carbohydrate. I train a lot. So I try to get as much carbohydrate in my diet as possible. It enhances my exercise performance, my recovery, and generally you can get a lot of carbohydrates for pretty cheap as well. And there's many different options, whether it be liquid or, you know, simple jellies or whatever, if you're trying to get in loads of carbs and you're an athlete, or you can be going for those more fibrous options which we will discuss now which should be the basis of most people's diets yeah and this is the thing we have to obviously tie it back to the actual individual in front of us like what is your activity level like how should we portion out these carbs but for most people and we'll talk about this in the food selection section in a second for most people we're going to be consuming or advocating the consumption of you know real food sources of carbohydrates and generally these are going to come along with more fiber right so this is why most people advocate for whole grains you know, you're getting a little bit more fiber in the diet as a result of that but even on top of that we generally just advocate eating more vegetables fruit and vegetables and we use those as kind of our we'll call it our base of our carbohydrates right because we actually have there's actually not a need like it's not an essential nutrient in the diet and um, like fiber i mean it's not an essential nutrient in the diet but that doesn't mean that it doesn't do essential things for the human body like it's actually really beneficial for overall digestion and thus overall detoxification and excretion of different things from the body and because you know you, you don't really think about this but like your poop and your urine and all that kind of stuff like it does actually contain stuff that your body has tried to get rid of you know, or is in the process of getting rid of, right? And it's not just like, oh, my poop is, you know, what I just ate. You know, that's not that's not the case. Your pee is not just the water you just drank. It's also other stuff from the body, right? But anyway, that's a little bit of a digression there. Overall, generally speaking, most people don't get enough fiber in the diet. And it's just, it's actually relatively easy to get enough fiber in the diet. What, how much fiber do we need? Roughly 10 to 15 grams per thousand calories. There are some numbers that, you know, different institutions and different organizations will give. They'll give like, oh, you need to consume 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. But that's just a general recommendation. It doesn't relate it back to your overall calorie, you know, expenditure, your overall body size, anything like that. So we generally relate it back to total calories. And as a result, we give that number of 10 to 15 grams of fiber for every thousand calories that you're eating. So if you're eating 3000 calories, you want to be consuming 30 to 45 grams of fiber, right? That's a good starting point. And again, we can modify that going forward. Say again, you're an individual that has to consume a lot of calories around 5,000, 6,000 calories. You're just exercising all the time. You know, maybe we don't need to go as high with our fiber intake. You might notice some gastrointestinal upset from that, or you just not feel great with that high of an intake. Consequently, we also have the situation where someone could be on a, you know, I don't know, 1500 calorie diet and they might be thinking, oh, I only need 15 grams of fiber. In that case, I would still be kind of bumping it up to higher levels, you know? And again, generally, I wouldn't focus too much on the actual like fiber intake. I would focus on the food selection side of things and basically just eat more vegetables. Generally, we also advocate eating like legumes and stuff like that beans, that kind of stuff, so that you're getting a lot of fiber in the diet generally. And then for our like more starchy carbohydrate sources, we're generally advocating for like whole grains and stuff like that, so that we're getting a little bit more fiber from that selection as well. Do you have anything else to say on fiber, Gary? No, sir, that's spot on. Yeah. So again, I didn't want to spend too much time on the carbohydrates and fiber because it's pretty straightforward. Portion the rest of your calories towards carbohydrates. And then a subsection of that is fiber. And we want to have roughly 10 to 15 grams per thousand calories as fiber in the diet, right? Now that covers the, the bulk of the diet. There are a few other things that we want to just quickly knock through. <clears throat> the first of all being water intake, right? Water intake is basically the, the next macronutrient. And it's one that people just, you know, ignore because it's very easy to ignore. But if you don't consume enough water, you're in a bad position. I'll leave it at that. Right? I think everyone understands the importance of hydration. You know, if you've ever been dehydrated or you've ever seen someone dehydrated, 
it's not great, right? Even if you have a mild dehydration, you're in a bad position, blood pressure wise, cognitive health wise, et cetera, right? So we want to consume enough water. What is enough? Well, again, this is going to be one of those things where it's actually hard to find particular numbers. I think it's two liters per day is a general recommendation for like population wide. But if you're an athlete or you exercise at all, it's actually surprisingly high. I think it's like four to five liters per day is the general recommendation. And I, I know a lot of people that go to the gym and they're like, yeah, I really care about my health. And they're getting maybe two liters of water per day, you know? And so if you are someone that's exercising, which we do generally recommend, we do advocate for higher water intakes. How high? Generally speaking, the starting point with water intake that we set is roughly 40 milligram or milliliters, I should say, per kilogram of body weight. So if you weigh 100 kilos, you're getting four liters of water per day. Stuff like coffee, tea, you know, juices, stuff like that. It does all contribute. I know a lot of people get, you know, into this mindset of like, oh, if I have coffee or something, it's going to be dehydrating, blah, blah, blah. It's just not the case. All the research uh, suggests that that's just not the case. Like, I don't know why that's still propagated. Like there is some research to suggest that is potentially dehydrating, but in habituated uh, coffee drinkers and stuff like that, it's just not a case. And also it's literally like fucking 95, 97% water. Like how is that not hydrating? You're saying that like, it just completely cancels that out. If you have a hundred milligrams of fucking caffeine in that, obviously that's not the case. Right. Um, <clears throat> do you want to say on water intake, Gary? No, I mean, I drink, a lot of water personally my i sweat quite a bit i sweat a lot during the night i sweat a lot during jiu-jitsu i don't sweat a lot when i lift weights at all so there is some variance there in terms of how much water i need to drink on a given day like if i'm just training in the gym i'm not going to be sweating that much to be honest you know if i'm just lifting if i'm doing lots of cardio or i'm doing jiu-jitsu i'll be sweating a ton then you know depending on you know where i'm sleeping what I'm wearing when I go to bed, you know, if I'm having nightmares or not, that might all vary or that might all uh, change the amount of water I'm taking in on any given day. Also changes if, you know, am I sitting at the desk all day, not really sweating, you know, not moving, or am I in the hospital on my feet all day in stressful situations? All these things kind of modify um, the amount I require. So what I try to do is for the most part, allow my thirst to guide me. But I only allow my thirst to guide me when I'm ensuring that my environment is going to allow my thirst to be reliable. So if I don't have water here, then I'm not going to have the tendency to go and get water just because I'm a little bit thirsty. So that can be, it can get a little bit messy. So you need to give yourself the opportunity to drink water and then drink it as you feel thirsty. You need to remove the barriers. Exactly. There, if there's any barrier or friction, then those things don't, don't uh, tend to be as useful. And then if I'm at jujitsu for an hour or two and I'm rolling and I'm sweating loads and my gi is soaked or my no gi gear is soaked, I know that my thirst isn't necessarily going to compensate for that amount of fluid. And I noticed that all of the time I could drink a liter, a liter and a half during the session, you know, drink another glass when I come home. And then it's an hour later and my head kind of feels a bit off and I go to the bathroom and it's still yellow. Um, and I know that I haven't compensated fully. So in those opportunities where I know I've lost a lot of fluid, I'll drink beyond my thirst um, to ensure that I'm replacing my fluids. But most of the time I'll allow thirst to guide me with the caveat that we don't want those barriers to be there. Because one of the things that happens a lot, actually, and this happens a lot in medical professionals, nurses, etc. cetera, um, when people are on the wards all day, let's say when I'm on placement, you could be, you know, doing something for eight hours or busy for eight hours. And because you're between different wards or operating theaters or whatever, you don't have a water bottle with you, you know? So unless you're making the conscious effort to go and get water, it kind of just goes to the back of your mind. And it only comes to the end of the day, then you're like, God, I haven't urinated all day. I haven't drank a glass of water in eight hours. And you feel like crap. And if you're going straight from work, you know, from your job, whatever job it happens to be, to um the gym then you're going to perform super poorly and that was very common during the pandemic especially when people were wearing um masks all the time or specific types of ppe that might restrict them from having water throughout the day and then they're also sweating a lot more especially if you're a nurse in a hospital wearing ppe and you're it's already warm and stressful as it is you could be super dehydrated going into a session and you wouldn't even realize it because the friction was there all day 
and you were just busy, you know, and that happens. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I have well, I have one question, and I have something to add. How do you account for the nightmares? How do I account for the nightmares? Do you increase or you decrease water intake? Oh, decrease because I be sweating like a motherfucker. <laughs> so you increase your water intake then to account for that, yeah? Ah, uh, yes. Fantastic. Anyway, that was an aside. The other thing I want to say is, yeah, you can use your urine color for a, a kind of proxy measure. Well, it's, it's almost a direct measure of your hydration status. Generally speaking, we advocate for five clear urinations per day. That generally correlates with good hydration. Now, obviously, that's not always uh, a reliable indication of your hydration status. And it can be thrown off a little bit, especially if you take something like a multivitamin, you know, it's going to be like, well, was that a clear urination or did I just piss out a load of, you know, B vitamins here? Like, would it have been clearer otherwise? Um, so that is something that we can use five clear urinations per day, generally advocated or uh, correlated with good hydration. And I don't just mean like, oh, I drank four liters of water in the last 20 minutes and I pissed five times. And as a result, you know, they were all clear. Like, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about spacing that out throughout the day. You know, do you have anything to add to that, Gary? No, I'd say I have about 15, but I don't think I'm a good reference. Yeah, well, you're, you're drinking more water. I'm saying like, this is the, the bare minimum here. We want to have at, yeah. least, at least five clear urinations. Like if you go to the toilet and every single day you go to the toilet, you're like, that, that's yellow like and you never see clear not even one two three times per day like you're probably dehydrated you probably need to consume more water right so we want to get again bare minimum five right and the next thing then is and it's kind of related to water intake it's our overall electrolyte balance and we don't actually need to focus on too many of these electrolytes because this podcast would go on for fucking hours but there are a few that we do want to con uh, consider or actually which is really only one that we want to consider that we could really go down a rabbit hole of some of the other ones but sodium intake, right? Generally speaking, we want to keep salt intake below five grams per day. That seems to be the, the sweet spot. <clears throat> and again, that's of, you know, sodium chloride table uh, salt. I was about to say table sugar, but table salt. That's realistically only, what is it like 2.5 or three grams of sodium per day is the, the maximum. So if you have sodium from other sources, you know, different foodstuffs and whatever else, we want to keep it below that five gram mark three grams ideally now this does change a little bit if you are someone like say gary if you're like oh i'm literally sweating buckets every single day you can get away with higher quantities of salt because in your sweat you are sweating out different salts sodium is one of them and as a result like you need probably some like some individuals do need to consume a little bit more sodium for example i've had numerous clients who you know either predominantly you know good diet they are eating like you know fresh vegetables fruits you know lean meats whatever else and they've been in a situation where they're feeling they're always a little bit crampy they're a little bit twitchy in their muscles they have a little bit of like restless legs when they're trying to go to sleep stuff like that and you know maybe they sweat a lot during their their training sessions and we go okay well let's actually just try a little bit more sodium in the diet because you know you're getting literally nothing and all of a sudden those issues are you know fixed up so that is one concern about eating too well if you will you can reach a situation where you're not consuming enough salt but for most people you know they're consuming too much salt it's so easy if you're eating like you know the general overall diet it's so easy to over consume salt and this is correlated with you know negative health outcomes especially related to blood pressure that's a big one that is correlated with high salt intakes but also stuff like stomach cancer which you know does not sound like a fucking great time for anyone and um, so generally we're advocating less than five grams per day of sodium or rather i should say salt do you have any anything to add to that gary no, I would, agree, I would agree with all that. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the things that people can get a little bit too focused on sometimes is like, oh, I sweated today in exercise. I need to make sure I really replace all this salt. And they throw back like five grams of salt back the gullet. Like it's for most people, that's that's not necessary. You know, most of your your sodium is not going to be excreted through sweat. It's far more common that it would be excreted through your urine. So while you do use lose some salt, you're probably not losing that much. And I would be particularly sensitive to this if you're someone whose blood pressure is already trending high. Um, you're probably not someone who wants to be, you know, shoveling back salt to try and replace it. Most people are 
if you're eating a, a diet that, you know, has some salt in it, you're probably going to be fine. The risk of you, you know, reducing your salt too low is just very, very low. And I would generally restrict more specific electrolyte concerns for, um, at least on the low end, for those who are doing more extreme endurance type of events um, or have certain, you know, kidney conditions or something. But for most people, it's not really an issue. Yeah, 100%. And again, we can get into other electrolytes and other minerals and whatever, like potassium. Generally, people don't consume enough potassium. A really simple fix for a lot of this stuff is just to switch out your salt, your home salt, whatever it is, for a potassium-based salt. Still has some sodium in it, but it also has more potassium in it. And as a result, you hit two birds with one stone or one salt, if you will, um, and you increase your potassium intake and you decrease your sodium intake. So that's generally better for blood pressure for one, but also it's generally better for a variety of health outcomes because traditionally humans have evolved eating a way higher uh, potassium intake. We don't even have a mechanism for like potassium thirst, if you will, because traditionally speaking, we've never needed that. People survived on like fruits, vegetables, tubers, you know, whatever. And as a result of that had fucking mega high potassium intakes, like 15 grams per day. And the reason we have like a salt taste, a salt, um, like thirst, if you will, a, a hunger, whatever you want to call it, a desire for salt is because traditionally speaking, humans just did not consume a lot of salt. You know, all of our systems in our body are basically set up for salt con uh, conservation rather than, you know, dealing with 10 grams, 15 grams of salt per day, which a lot of Western populations can get up into those high numbers of salt intake per day. You know, like if you go out and you get like, you know, a ready-made meal for lunch and, you know, a snack or whatever, you go out for dinner, all of a sudden you could literally have consumed like 20 grams of salt in that day, you know, without even feeling like, Oh yeah, like I'm, I'm, I didn't salt my food, you know, it's just in the food that you're eating, you know? And um, now a lot of food formulation formulating these days is, you know, aimed towards, you know, getting sodium intake a little bit lower and you will see on packaging and stuff like they'll have it highlighted in like red and stuff where it's like this food contains more sodium. Right. But anyway, salt, that's one of the things now, there are a few things that we just want to finish up on this or finish this podcast up on there just to kind of close everything out. And the first thing is food selection, or I should say that some of the final things are food selection. And basically like, this is such a huge, huge topic, right? We could spend just the entire podcast talking about food selection. And as a result, I'm basically just going to define it or refine it down. I should say to just eat real food. We're just going to use this you know, tagline of jerf, you know, just eat real food, right? That's going to be the baseline of your diet. Now, does that mean that you get all orthorexic with this shit and be like, I can't eat anything if, you know, a human has touched it. You know, I can't, you know, a peeled banana. I couldn't eat that. It's processed, you know? Like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fundamental foundations of your diet. You're basically aiming to eat real food. It's food that, you know, you could have eaten 100 years ago. You know, your grandparents would have eaten, right? Now, is that the best optimal way to think about food selection not always right and we're well aware of that however we're just talking about this general general framework for the diet here now we want to eat some lean meats you know some fish we want to eat some fruits vegetables some tubers potatoes that kind of stuff some whole grains happy days you know steer away from high like super high saturated fat intake but you do also want to consume like dairy products Ideally, especially if you are a Western population, you want to be consuming uh, some fish. That would be ideal. I know I said that, but also some source of iodine. A lot of uh, Europeans especially are deficient in iodine because they don't eat a lot of seafood, sea products, maybe get some seaweed in your diet. And as you can see, we can start layering on more and more and more in terms of like what would constitute good food selection. And we might do an episode or episodes on that in future. But for now, just eat real food, food, eat a variety of colors, eat some lean meats, go about your day. Do you mind to add to that, Gary? I'm sure you have some thoughts on food selection. I mean, like if you're eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, you're making a conscious effort to get in, you know, your whole grains, you're trying to hit the fiber, like we said, and you're eating your lean meats or, you know, animal-based proteins and or you're making a conscious effort to get in your plant-based proteins, um, whether it be tempeh, tofu, scent, what, what's the other one? They, they all, I don't care. They all taste disgusting. 
Yeah, they they all look look and taste disgusting. No, no disrespect. Oh, um, I mean disrespect. They're and, disgusting. And all the soy based meats, etc. Um, once you're making a conscious effort to get in these types of foods as the basis of your diet, you're probably doing a pretty good job. The thing is, when you use that kind of heuristic of just eat real food while appreciating that you know that's not going to cover everyone and it's open to interpretation. When you set the basis like that, you take care of a lot of the things that would otherwise be micromanaging, such as like managing your sodium intake. I was speaking to a client last week. He's got polycystic kidney disease, early stage. He's hypertensive, so his blood pressure is high. And we're really trying to keep an eye on his salt intake. And he was grabbing something in the shop like he normally would. No big deal. Just picked up a sandwich. Pretty sure it was like whole grain bread. Um, some chicken, you know, he was just trying to get a, a high protein meal in with a decent amount of fiber. And he looked at the packet and it was over three grams of salt just in that sandwich. And that's not like McDonald's. That's not him choosing crisps. It was just a, a regular enough sandwich that most people would think is probably healthy. And that was three grams of salt. If he did that, you know, at, at, at lunch and he's a big guy, he could have easily picked up two of those. He's like over a hundred kilos. Um, you're talking potentially six grams of salt there maybe another gram or two at dinner, gram or two at breakfast, you're talking 10 plus grams of salt there without even making, without it, without making deliberately high salt choices or adding lots of salt. So if you're choosing those kind of whole foods, making your food at home, um, most of the time, you're going to be taking care of the other things that you would otherwise have to micromanage, such as sodium, such as fiber, such as some of the other micronutrients and so on. So I think it's a, although it's, it's reductionistic and it wouldn't be public health policy, it's certainly a good starting point for most people. And it's something I think about myself. You know, if I find myself eating too much processed food, everything's coming from a packet and stuff, I have to call myself out on that because it's just not the best way to practice nutrition long-term. 100%. And as I said, look, we could talk about this stuff all day and we might in future, <laughs> but for now, just use that general heuristic of the, just eat real food. What is real food? Again, starches, whole grains, um, fruit and veg, lean meats. Again, stuff that came from the land. You know, basically think of it like that. <laughs> Humans didn't have a, a role to play in it apart from maybe agriculture and, you know, animal husbandry and all that kind of stuff. Um, the next thing then is food timing. Again, look, you can get caught up in the nuances of this. We could, again, spend an entire podcast series talking about this stuff. But it all comes down to basically eat three to four times per day you know get a general well-balanced meal at each of those you know meal opportunities call it good you know we can talk about oh what should we do before training after training blah 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 it realistically pales in comparison to just get three to four good meals per day you're done see you later right we could maybe make an argument for tapering back calories towards the end of the day, we could we, we could make that argument and say that's a, a benefit. But generally, that goes uh, against most cultural practices where most people eat more at the end of the day. Most people are not eating like a huge breakfast, a smaller lunch, and then a, a, a tiny dinner. Most people are going like you know, a relatively small breakfast, maybe a small lunch, and then a fucking huge dinner. <laughs> and we could argue that that's a, a bad thing. But even in that case, I would be fairly happy if someone was getting protein and carbs and fats at each of those uh, meals and they were just hitting their targets. I'd be like, yeah, look, cool. That's that's you done. You've got your three meals per day. So three to four meals per day. That's our general recommendation about food timing. We don't have to go too in-depth onto this. Again, it's not, it's just a nothing burger to me. Um, but what, what are your thoughts, Gary? Yeah, I would agree. It's not something I pay that much attention to really once I'm eating something within one to three hours of my workout I almost always feel good sometimes longer before depends on the intensity of the session um, and then the overall kind of eating window again I do think there's merit to the idea that cutting calories off in the evening a little bit earlier is probably a wise idea however given that most people work morning to late afternoon slash evening jobs and then go to the gym after we do run into obstacles in people who are actively training most people partaking in sports um generally training at 6 or 7 p.m 
So it's, it's probably a good idea from a sports nutrition principle to eat after uh, that training session. And I don't think you're going to be dealing with deleterious health effects from that. So while there's certainly merit to the idea of cutting your uh, eating window off a little bit in the evening, I think for a lot of people, the practical um, limitations might interfere with that. And I think that once you're taking care of all the other things in this podcast, I think that that's probably of minimal concern to you. 100%. And then I, there's, on top of that, I basically advocate with a lot of my clients to set up a meal structure or a meal schedule where they just don't have to think about this stuff, right? So it kind of relates to the food timing. I just get my clients to be like, right, you have a rough eating window here. This is your breakfast period, your lunch period, your dinner, whatever makes sense for that individual. And then have a rough idea of what kind of meals make sense for you? Like, are you going to eat, I don't know, ostrich burgers and fucking quail eggs for breakfast? You know, most people are going to be like, no, I'm, I'm not going to eat that. That's just not a breakfast food for me. So we're going to pick some breakfast foods. We're going to be like, right, you can rotate through these. So you're not just getting bored. Like some people are like, I don't mind. I'll eat the same thing every single fucking day. But a lot of people get bored with that. So let's have a few different options. What makes sense? Oh, you're rushing out the door. Do we have something that you can put together in five minutes? Do you have something that you can literally grab and go? Do you have something that you're like, I have a little bit more time for this meal. I want to just enjoy it. I want to like read the newspaper, whatever it is that you do. Do we have options for that? Because if you don't have options, you don't even know, you can't even think about like, what would I do at this meal? We're going to run into trouble, right? So create those options, right? And then set a basic schedule, a basic routine for your food. This is, you know, a basic plan of action. And this is one of those things which you'd be surprised how little people do, but actually, you know, I'm going to the shops this week. What am I going to get for my different dinners? You know, what am I going to cook for my different dinners? People will basically just wing it, you know, and that's fine. It keeps things, you know, interesting, but it's very unlikely that you're going to hit, hit your targets or that you're going to be in the best health body composition or reach your best performance as a result of just winging it. You need to have some sort of plan of action for your meals. And again, this is hard for some people. Like you might be listening to this and I don't know, your parents still make your dinner or your partner makes the dinner or whatever it is, you're in some sort of communal setting. I don't know, you're a fireman or something. And you're like, all right, well, you know, at the station, whoever is on the day, they make the dinner, they make the food, they make whatever. You might not have a huge amount of control in the situation. However, you still need to create some sort of plan around that. If you're like, oh, I have less control at this meal, that means your other meals need to have more control or rather you need to have more control of those other meals to account for the fact that you've less control at this meal, you know? So we want to create some sort of rough schedule, some sort of rough routine. And you might think that this is one of those things where it's kind of like destroys your freedom, but ultimately man, it gets so, it gets rid of so many headaches in the diet, so much noise. If you just have a plan of action for this stuff and a, like a rough template, like you can forget about the nutrition and it's just on autopilot. I know people think of it the opposite way where it's like, oh, well, it's all rigid and it's really defined and it's not enjoyable then. But honestly, thinking about what you're going to eat every single day, exhausting. You're not going to stick to any kind of diet as a result of that. Whereas if you're just like, these are breakfast foods, I just eat these foods, boom, I know I hit my targets. If I eat these foods, happy days, don't have to think about it. This is what I get for lunch. This is what I do. If I'm in work, I'm going on the go. You know, you have some general like, portion control method you're like this is roughly how much protein i need this is roughly how much carbs i need this is you know roughly fats this all this kind of stuff you have an idea of what that looks like for you you have a rough schedule happy days you put this stuff on autopilot you never think about it again because ultimately while we've gone through all the numbers and we've gone through all the like this is what you should do ultimately we want to create a diet where it's just on autopilot. We don't think about this. We don't have to look at what we're doing. We don't have to actively track anything. We don't have to you know, spend a lot of our uh, cognitive resources thinking about this stuff because you've just put it on autopilot. Now that does generally involve a period of time, especially initially, like spending more time tracking, spending more time really thinking about this. But the end goal should always be to have this stuff on autopilot not think about it. And then you just get on with the stuff that actually really matters for your life, your higher purpose in this world, not just, oh yeah, how many calories do I have left today? Like nobody cares, you know? Um, but do you have any thoughts on that, Gary, creating this kind of rough framework and then also, you know, getting the diet to that place where it's just on autopilot? I would very much agree. And I think that the that has always served me absolutely best, especially when I, anytime I'm trying to lose body fat, 
you know, you can become quite food focused, especially if you're already very lean and you want to do as much to take some of the cognitive energy away from that. Okay. And if you can have your nutrition on autopilot, have a rough food structure, meal structure, daily structure, it doesn't mean that you need to have a very strict meal plan, but I think some sort of loose meal plan where you're kind of straddling between macro and calorie tracking and having some sort of structure. I think that's a very wise approach. 100%. Anyway, I'm just going to finish up this podcast here. And the final thing I just want to touch on is the fact that you're going to have to learn to live with the fact that like nutrition is messy, right? It's never perfect. You're going to mess up. You're going to be out for an event. You're going to do X, Y, Z. The biggest skill that you can learn, if you take away nothing from this podcast and you just take away this, the biggest skill that you can learn is just get straight back on track, draw a line under it, forget about it boom, straight back on track at the next opportunity. None of this, oh, I'll wait till Monday or I'll wait till whenever. No, fuck that. Doesn't work. Never works. You, you know it doesn't work. Stop doing this yourself. Just go, oh, I you know messed up at this uh, middle of the day opportunity for uh, uh, a food opportunity here. And it's Thursday and it's you know lunchtime. You're like, oh, I'll just start again on Monday. How is that going to lead to the success that you want? It's not, right? You just get straight back on track that Thursday evening meal. Maybe you adjust your intake. You're like, oh, I ate too much at lunch. I'm going to eat a little bit more at dinner. Cool. You're done. Forget about it. Move on. Or even if you just go, right, I had a planned meal for that Thursday. I'm going to eat that and I'm going to still just move on and forget about the overconsumption or the food that I ate that I shouldn't have eaten, blah, blah, blah. Right. If you can get that and you can really get that into your head and like really internalize it, you are going to succeed with nutrition. It's just it's inevitable if you can forget about the the negative stuff and just keep moving forward right now obviously again this ties back in with the thing that we covered at the start if you are setting up your diet for failure by eating you know a thousand calories you're always going to end up in this cycle of binge eating effectively where you're like oh i fucked up here and you know i have to consume twenty thousand calories on the saturday yeah the reason you're doing that is because you're in a huge deficit monday to friday and you're just fucking hungry your body's just starved so eat a little bit more only be in a slight calorie deficit if you're trying to lose weight and then again just draw a line through it just draw a line under it whatever move on check anyway gary do you have anything further to say or do you want to just wrap this up no i think that wraps it up as we said this is a loose loose but detailed over overview of what you should know about nutrition so hopefully this gives you a review of everything that you should know there may be things that were new to you in this episode depending on where you're coming from and i would encourage you to look back through our podcast archive and see if there's further things that might be of interest to you for example if you think we flew over the protein intake section we've got podcasts on protein if we flew over discussions on fiber We've got podcasts on fiber. So we've discussed all this stuff in separate podcast episodes ourselves and with others. For example, if you're wondering, wait, what's that saturated fat thing about? I thought that didn't matter. We've got podcasts that we've recorded ourselves and with Alan Flanagan. If you just look past back to the podcast archive, you'll learn a lot there. So hopefully you learned a thing or two. If you do need further guidance on your nutrition, you want more personalized guidance heading into 2022, we are accepting new clients at the moment. That includes nutrition only coaching with our nutritionists or full coaching inclusive of training and nutrition and all that comes with that with the remainder of our coaches. So that's the primary thing I want you to be aware of at the moment. If you want to get involved, get in touch with us ASAP. The information will be linked in the description box below, or you can get in contact with any of us on our social media. If you're not following us on social media, the primary channel that we use is Instagram. So if you subscribe or follow us on Instagram at triage method, you'll also be able to see all of our coaches there. We post content on the triage Instagram and also on our individual Instagrams. So you can follow those individual pages by clicking the following section on the triage method page, and you'll be able to find us all from there. Other than that, we always appreciate when people give us feedback on the podcast whether that's just a message or a share or a rating and review if your podcast app allows we always appreciate that so you can do all of that if possible that's it i think 
yeah, that's everything. I, mean, I have nothing else to say, so I hope everyone enjoyed that. And I don't know what date this will be going out at. If I don't speak to you, or I don't, you don't listen to my sweet melodic voice before Christmas, Sol Invictus's birthday, then um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's a fantastic one for you and your family. Trying to finish up on Gary? No. Merry Christmas. <laughs>